The cyber threats to Israel's election took center stage this week. Yesterday, we found out that the cell phone of former Prime Minister Ehud Barak was hacked months ago, and its contents were apparently sold to Iran. And that news came just three days after Israeli media reports that Iran had hacked into the blue and white party leader Benny Gantz's cell phone and accessed its and accessed its contents. Sound familiar? Maybe because all this oddly echoes the events of the 2016 U.S. election campaign. But just how serious are these hacks and how safe is Israel's ballot box? I am joined now by two cybersecurity experts, founder and CEO at Confidas Ram Levy and head of threat intelligence at Clear Sky Cybersecurity, Eyal Sela. Eyal and Ram, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Um, Ram, let me start with you and the Iranians. Are they known for being good at this kind of stuff? Well, the Iranians are known for being good uh, at this kind of stuff, and we should expect all nations that uh, that are you know, that want intelligence to have capabilities of hacking into phones and into computers, and especially into leaders of political candidates that are supposed to be the prime minister, the next prime minister of Israel. How how, how easy is it to hack into a phone, and and and, and what kind of information now could be available to the people that did that so it depends on the phone on the and the person and the context but but the basic assumption is that it's quite easy uh, even if the person is trying to pr uh, protect themselves there's many different ways I'm not saying each and every phone is very very easily uh, breachable but it's safe to assume that if someone wants in, and especially if it's a nation state, then they would be able to do it. And now what's in a phone, you know what's in a phone. You know, your emails, contact details, SMS messages. Contact details when it comes to someone like Benny Gantz, it could be someone who's a lot, you know, senior, senior people in the security establishment. Likely, uh, I, I would assume all the, the, the contact people, I would assume they already have that, uh, already, uh, whatever okay. uh, country that is, or whoever breached it. But the content of the, the in the, the email, uh, correspondence and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, it could be sensitive. It really depends on him. I would expect that because it's a civil network and device not to have any very sensitive contact there, okay. maybe personal one though. Okay, I want to show you something that, you know, Benny Gantz, of course, is trying to brush this off as if it's nothing. Here's what he said a few days ago when it was uh, revealed. I reiterate to you that there was no security threat and there is no security material. And I am in no way subject to blackmail. But the Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, is saying that Gantz is a compromised candidate, Ram. So who's got it right? Well, I think both sides got it right. Of course, the Prime Minister will say that Benny Gantz is a compromised candidate. And of course, Benny Gantz will say that there is no security or defensive content on the phone. But this is not the only issue. It's not only about the content on the phone. It's also about the meta content on the phone. For example, who he met with when they met with, where he's been, uh, who has also been in the same area that he has been with, that's one thing. But then there's another question. We don't know what was on the phone, and I don't think Benjamin Netanyahu would know what was on the phone. The only person who knows what was on the phone is the adversary who took what's right. on the phone, and Benny Gantz. <laughs> uh, yeah. But because we don't know, the next step will be that someone will say that something was on his phone, and we will never be able to tell whether it's true or false. By the way, should, should Benny Gantz and Ehud Barak be blamed for having their phone hacked, being, you know, the more, the, 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 secu the security experts that they are? I, I think it, it could be uh, possible that someone who's even an expert in some field can still be breached. It, it, by no means a person who's very knowledgeable cannot be breached. Mm -hmm. And in any case, if you're the manager of a company, it doesn't mean that you are the best technical person. But I, I think it's also important to remember that uh, they, they got breached, but, you, you know, you should assume being breached. There are many cases that have not been reported publicly that did happen. And someone can leak information or even claim that they've breached someone else. And sometimes it's hard to prove what did or did not happen. And, and, and that's the wrong way in all the time, not only with these cases. Mm -hmm. so, so I think it's important to remember that. And because we are aware of this specific case, which is important, mm -hmm. I think we still need to remember there is much, much more that we do not know about other right. uh, breaches that mm. have happened, and it's not the only case. Well, let's zoom out a little. What other ways, Ram, can foreign countries, you know, intervene uh, in, 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 the, in the Israeli election? And, and would there be anyone besides Iran who would want to intervene in the Israel upcoming general election? Well, when we say intervene in the Israeli election, we actually mean how to cause those who want to vote not to vote, and those who want to vote change their votes. So we're actually, we're actually looking for a way to target people 
to change direction. If I want to uh, vote for the Likud party, for the right wing party, and I'm intervening in, in, in favor of the, of the left wing, then I want who, those who are voting for the Likud not to go out to vote. That's what happened in Brazil, for example. So I could, for example, I could change, I could make them feel that whatever they do, their ballot is worth nothing. So at some point, they will lose their motivation to go out and vote. Or I can change those who, are, who right now think that they have no choice in winning these elections, that it's their voice that counts. So basically, it's about creating the impression that you can do something about it. That's the way you intervene. So you do that by creating propaganda for the side that you want, that, for the side that, that you want them to win. And how strong is Israel versus this, this threat? Uh, uh, if you're talking about cybersecurity capabilities, then I would say basically stronger. But, but you don't have to compare because you can be not that capable and still being able to breach someone's phone. You know, mm. it's a private phone, it's private person at I the think, end. By the way, can they, can they skew the results, for example? Because I think I, I want our viewers to know that, that, that voting in Israel is about taking an envelope, putting a piece of paper yeah. in it, and putting it into a box. That's yeah. it. And then the numbers are, are put into a computer afterwards. Can that be... No, that, no. That's, that's, not, that's not something that can happen. No. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be too worried about that. I would expect it to be validated in many different ways, and I, I, I wouldn't say there is any compromise or a risk of compromise at okay. this stage. Okay, I want to show some more a poll that was done by Pew that uh, asked, uh, is Israel prepared to handle a major cyber attack? And 73% said that Israel is well prepared. 20% uh, said it is not uh, well prepared. So there seems to be a lot of uh, faith. W would you agree that Israel is... Uh, well prepared for, for handling attacks like this? Yeah, I think we're pretty much prepared. I mean, we've been, uh, I've been the secretary for the Prime Minister's National Cyber Initiative in 2010. Uh, Israel is, is investing a lot of efforts, money, resources from the Prime Minister down mm. uh, into securing and hardening our critical infrastructure, our banking systems, our trading houses, our insurance companies, uh, critical infrastructure like uh, airlines and, uh, and, and, and maritime. So we are aware of the threats and there are a lot of efforts done uh, there, are also, there are also efforts done on the government level. There is a computer emergency response team and a new authority that's been formed and regulations, so on and so forth. So we're pretty much, we're pretty much in a good situation. But I think when it, when, it, when it comes to influencing the election, it's not about attacking critical infrastructure. It's about in making the people believe in something that's fake, fake news. Fake news. It's social media. And the whole basically. thing about Benny Gantz is about planting the seed for fake news. Mm. Would you agree with that? Then it's, all, it's all about the fake news, it's not necessarily about infrastructure? Well, first, it, it could be different things. I think at the moment we don't have any proof of anything going to happen or not. So we cannot know if anyone is going to use this information, and I'm really not sure that's what's going to happen. specifically? I'm talking about the phone specifically, yeah. Okay. But in general, because the election, Central Election Committee has warned that there are, are it looks like there are going to be and cyber attacks. That this phone was hacked. I mean, there, there you go. I mean, it's proof. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was hacked. I'm, I'm asking: is, it, is the information going to be used by anyone to, to you know, to try to skew anything? Right. But, but I think there is one more important point. Over the long term, people uh, might not trust the system, even if the results themselves have not been changed. If people believe that they might be changed or that there is a lot of disinformation, then they might not trust the results because, because they think that someone caused other people to vote right. in this and other ways. And then if you don't trust the democratic system, then there's a much bigger and long-term problem. So we're seeing this intervention more and more, this threat, you know, around the world. Who has the upper hand usually? Is it the hackers or are, we, or are the governments usually just responding slowly? <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends who you ask. Most people say that the hackers have the upper hand, but I, I'm, I'm from the, I'm, I'm old school. I say that governments have the upper hand if they decide they want to have the upper hand. Mm. Once they decide they want to eliminate the threat, the threat will be eliminated because they have much more resources than all the hackers combined. 20 seconds, who has the upper hand? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a very complicated uh, it's question. Too complicated for 20 seconds. I, I have to say that both sides have their successes and you can see that. So it's hard to say, you know, there's one winner. It, it, it's it's uh, many different things that happen. So I wouldn't take any very specific side, but I agree that the hackers tend to get what they want in many cases. Oh.